Good evening, everyone. In less than two weeks, New York City will elect its first new mayor in 12 years, likely the first Democratic mayor in 20 years. The polls predict that public advocate Bill de Blasio will be that new mayor. He is some 40 points ahead of the Republican, former MTA chairman and Giuliani deputy mayor, Joe Loda. But the race is still very much on. And last night, right here at the CUNY Graduate Center, we saw the most fiery debate yet. Loda said de Blasio's plan to rewrite his tale of two cities would push us back to a time of runaway, runaway crime and high taxes and would annihilate charter schools. Tonight, in an hour-long live special, we deconstruct last night's debate and examine the issues behind the rhetoric. So welcome to the program, which tonight is a special collaboration with the CUNY Forum, hosted by Bob Liff, who describes himself as a recovering journalist. Part of what Bob's recovering from is covering City Hall, including Joe Loda for the Daily News and Newsday back in the Giuliani days. Bob? Uh, thanks, Brian. I also covered de Blasio in uh, City Hall. The, the uh, CUNY Forum includes a live audience, and, and tonight is no exception. Each month we dig into a topic and invite, and invite tomorrow's public servants to uh, take part. They are uh, students from, from the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs, and they'll be asking some questions later on. And to help us answer those questions and to deconstruct last night's debate, Bob and I are joined by political strategist and commentator L. Joy Williams. She's worked inside City Hall and for political campaigns, including former city comptroller Bill Thompson's 2009 run for the mayoralty. She is founder of LJW Community Strategies. Hi, Joy. Hi. Thank you for having me. And let's begin by looking at the very start of last night's debate with one of the most questionable questions ever to begin a debate. Sir, if you were the driver of that SUV on the West Side Highway, confronted by a mob of bikers, your wife and infant inside there with you, you've already called 911, you feel like your lives are being threatened, what would you have done? Well, as I think a lot of people in this city know, nothing is more important to me than my family, my wife and my daughter Chiara, my son Dante. I would defend them with all I had. You know, once you've done the right thing and called 911, if you're under attack, uh, the most important thing to do is protect your family, and that's what I do with everything in my being. Wow, Joy, <laughs> what a question. It's not a policy question. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with what kind of a mayor he would be, mm -hmm. presumably. Uh, what do you make of it? Well, particularly since the mayor will have security around him all the time in terms of what an individual mayor would do in this situation. Um, it, it was just a very interesting question. And I know the purpose of it was to sort of put everybody who was watching in the shoes of those who were in the car and ask someone, which people are talking about, people are talking about in the streets what they would have done, what police should have done, what people in the car should have done. And so the question was to elicit some sort of personal response, to get some personality from both of the candidates, and that was the purpose of it. But it certainly was reminiscent of something else. I also think that <laughs> both of them responded by kind of briefly saying, of course I would defend my family, and then they began to talk about policy implications of police and I mean it was an odd question I happen to think that Maurice Dubois did a very good job I think a one person one smart person moderating a debate let it let it flow much but I think there were very good debates but debates have signifiers and I think he was entering into a debate that we're going to be talking about which went into some racially tinged mm -hmm. uh, whether it was fear-mongering as de Blasio said or you know he also said it was kind of racially motivated that's probably more debatable but so I mean it was it it entered into a section of the debate that I think right. was uh, pretty and, interesting. And I agree with you that Maurice Dubois did an excellent job moderating the debate in general last night and who knows who wrote that question and told him to begin with a personal yeah. what I think was a tabloid kind of question mm -hmm. rather than a policy question which you're right they gave policy answers to so they went there. Well you always but, answer the question you wanted to have heard. And just think about if they would have answered it in a different way, sort of what the response would, you know, response would be. And I think what they were trying to do, whoever wrote the question, is sort of separate themselves from, you know, the other debates that have been on. Now, I think what they were trying to do there was set a trap, probably <laughs> for de Blasio, because there was a time in history when another anchor asked that question of presidential candidates 
and it turned out to be critical in the campaign in 1988. Who is old enough to remember? First question goes to Governor Dukakis. You have two minutes to respond. Governor, if Kitty Dukakis were raped and murdered, would you favor an irrevocable death penalty for the killer? No, I don't, Bernard, and I think you know that I've opposed the death penalty during all of my life. Uh, I don't see any evidence that it's the, the deterrent, and I think there are better and more effective ways to deal with violent crime. We've done so in my own state, and it's one of the reasons why we have uh, had the biggest drop in crime of any industrial state in America, why we have the lowest murder rate of any industrial state in America. And for those of you who are not following politics in 1988, that turned out to be a very crucial moment in that race and a reason that Michael Dukakis lost to the first George Bush. What did he do wrong, Bob? You remember that. Well, he reacted coldly and without any degree of emotion. I mean, I worked on New Yorkers Against the Death Penalty for many, many years. And, you know, terrible cases, sort of the way the motorcycle case presents itself, um, are very, are, you know, supposed to be the toughest answers to give and you know to me the answer to that question was I may want to kill the person who killed my wife but I don't think that the state should kill them I mean he didn't re he reacted coldly I thought I thought last night both Loda and and uh, and de Blasio reacted as human beings as family men yeah. exactly and I think they learned that uh, Dukakis lesson well because <laughs> that really is such a famous moment in political history now in that same 1988 presidential campaign, there was another moment that has overtones for today in this mayoral campaign. It was the Willie Horton ad, what has come to be known as the Willie Horton ad. For historical context, let's look at that before we see the current Joe Loda ad that is sparking a similar conversation. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. 1988, ad for George Bush against Michael Dukakis, and that was raising an issue of weekend furloughs for murderers, but it came to be seen as a racist ad. And, and throughout history, it's still been um, put before in terms of how uh, candidates can use fear-mongering or sort of use the attitudes of society or the public that they know fully well and sort of stoke those fears and stoke those attitudes to push people their way. And it's the same thing that, you know, in the next one you're going to show with Joe Loda, that people view and see the same process. So, you tell me, folks, was that ad doing the same thing that this ad, currently running for Joe Loda, is trying to do today. Bill de Blasio voted to take over 5,000 cops off our streets. And de Blasio's response to violent biker gangs? Visit motorcycle clubs and talk to bikers? Bill de Blasio's recklessly dangerous agenda on crime will take us back to this. Don't let Bill de Blasio take New York backwards. The Loda ad. Bob, there's a famous quote from Lee Atwater, who was the campaign manager <laughs> for George Bush back then. He said, by the time we're finished with this campaign, America is going to think that Willie Horton is Michael Dukakis's running mate. Well, Scary black guy running with. Probably, the, the, most, probably the most emotional exchange last night was when... Um, de Blasio said that that is fear-mongering, and it's, I, I, I can't remember if he used the word a racist ad, but I believe he did use the word racist. All right, so let's jump in, yes. because the, I agree, this was the heart of the debate last night. This is going to be a two-minute excerpt. Let's hear them and watch them talking about that ad. 
fun. My entire Let's career, I've done nothing but work with people and bring them together. Uh, your, I've been ad certainly does, your ad I've doesn't been look cast. like something that's trying to bring people together, Mr. Loda. It's, it trying, really to, it's trying to tell people what would happen to it's you and how dangerously reckless you it's are. It's race-baiting it and fear-mongering. Okay. Uh, well, you well, know well, it. Well, stop. You we know it. There's nothing race-baiting about There's that. There's nothing race-baiting about it. You want to throw out the race card? I just you talk, said it. Let's talk, about, let's talk about the various different mass cards that are put out for the thousands of people that are killed in this city. Let's talk about the report cards for the kids who are being kept in uh, failing schools. Let's talk about the scorecard that says New York City is the highest tax city in the country. Don't tell me I threw out the race card, because there is nothing racial in there. Mr. And Bill, Loda, you cannot stoop Mr. down low to bring that as, up. Mr. as uh, upset as he wants to be. I'm not but upset. But the bottom line is, the <laughs> bottom line is, his ad depicted images of riots, of dead bodies in the streets, of racial imagery, clearly meant what, to be what fear racial mongering. Imagery? Go what look at your own imagery? ad. Go look no, at your no, own no. ad. You tell Anybody who looks at that okay. ad knows what he's up to, and is what his boss, Rudy Giuliani, used to be up to, and it's not what a mayor should be doing. Okay. Look, I'm, I am getting sick and tired of you impugning the integrity of Rudy Giuliani. Let me tell you I something. I would be happy he was to debate man, Mr. Giuliani. He was the man, <laughs> he was the man who created the renaissance in this city, who started the programs to make all New Yorkers safe, to expand our economy, to expand our jobs. And you keep impugning his integrity. He did Look, more to divide the city than David any mayor Dinkins in recent memory. That's just any. not true, John. David Dinkins did more to divide this city just during his true. period of time, the murders that happened, the actual race riots that happened. Believe me, the reason why he got thrown out is because he was divisive. You know, Joe Loda is using a Republican right-wing playbook. I have seen this more times than I could count. I compared his ad to the Willie Horton ad because it immediately reminded me of it. I felt like it was the 1980s all over again. The heart of the debate, in my opinion, from last night. Uh, let me turn to the students on our audience and ask for your reactions to what you've seen so far. Did you know some of that history? What do you think of this Loda ad and the exchange that they just had about it? We'll go to you in just a minute. Let me get some quick reactions from our panelists first. Joy? Well, I mean, the first thing is, often at times in these situations, people don't separate someone being racist and things being racially insensitive, um, inciting racial uh, uh, thinking or things like that. Right? So I don't think at all, and people respond that way, when someone says racial or racist, they immediately think you are calling me a racist. And not that possibly. The ad that your team put together can be racially insensitive to a city that has experienced this before. Now I think Lotus' position, and he seemed really um, well, he know, was, genuine in his belief. Well, he was prepped for it. He thought about yeah. it. He knew this was going to happen. Right. And I think they were careful not to show a real explicit, you know, dark person's right, face shot like the Willie Horton ad because of the Willie Horton right. ad, because of that ad and that history that's so well known in politics. Um, nevertheless, there was something that was suggestive of dark people. Well, it, but, well it clearly was fear mongering. Um, I thought that Eric Enquist of Cranes, who was on uh, New York One after the debate, he made the point that the reason that that ad is not effective is. We're, is that we're a different city. Yeah. People don't think we're going back there. But, you know, Joe Loda, uh, when he goes back to, to uh, uh, cite Rudy, to cite Rudy Giuliani, who was quite divisive because I, I covered him, um, you know, we're a democratic city, and we would never elect anybody except a Democrat except for the last five times. <laughs> and, the, and, in, and in 1993, we elected uh, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani in the wake of the Crown Heights riots. Um, Loda knows very well that this is a fear-mongering ad that, is a, that may have a level of deniability, but one of his problems this year is we don't have the kind of cataclysmic, existential, right. cata, you know, catastrophic. We don't have 9-11 uh, and, 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 and a weak Democratic candidate in Mark Green. Yeah. We don't have the Crown Heights riots and an arguably a weak candidate in David Dinkins. We don't have that. And so he's got to try to kind of pull out the oldies and not so goodies in order to in order to try to change right. what's what right now is a you know is a freight train aiming and at. while they didn't explicitly show black or latino looking faces it doesn't matter. among the perps <laughs> that what they did show at the very end was a face of an older 
white mm -hmm. woman. And the people around being him is sort of being dark and sort of being afraid, do yeah. you remember this? And that's the problem. You know, my friends and I, we call it, you know, sometimes campaigns and offices should have, you know, the Department of Jamal. Just to run ads and the run things. The Department of Jamal. Jamal. Just to run things by someone. Let people of color, let LGBT, let other people sort of view your stuff before you send it out to see if there would be some implications. Unless that. that's the point. Unless that's the point. So, hi there. Could you identify yourself and everybody when you speak tonight, identify yourself uh, with your name and what school you're from? Good evening. My name is Isolda and I attend Brooklyn College. And I have a question for you guys. Um, race is being debated as a subtext in this contest. Does the debate about crime between the two candidates mean that we are not really living in a post-racial city? Well, that's a very interesting question as a post-racial city. I mean, one of the really striking factors in the uh, Democratic primary is that Christine Quinn, who is both gay and a woman, lost the woman's vote and the gay vote. Uh, Thompson split the African-American vote with um, de, Blasio. Uh, de Blasio. So, um, you know, I don't think we're post-racial, but I do think that uh, Reverend Sharpton called it, you know, the uh, it's identity of political issues as opposed to identity of race and and ethnicity. Um, and so, what you have people doing is voting on their interests, voting on their which uh, is the local way it's supposed issues, to work, which is what people are doing. And you know, and it's different. It's not as if you're running. I, I think it would have been different if Thompson was the uh, charismatic sort of and right on the issues. Um, and on stop and frisk and things like that, it would have been a tighter race. And sort of, you have people describing that Bill de Blasio had the passion that people wanted de Blasio, you know, Thompson to have. And so I think that, that that's the difference, but particularly that people are voting their interest. And particularly that stop and frisk became such a large issue in the campaign. It became a signifier. It became the issue of the campaign, and particularly for communities of color, that is what they base their support on. And the only exception, which should be noted, is that the Asian American vote did go mostly for John Liu. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't every single Democratic constituency by ethnic group or identity group going for Bill Clinton. I don't want to overanalyze over 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 this, but in the case of John Liu, you had a first. Yes, you know, and, and so, that's the, that, and that's and that's the that, difference yeah. because right. you also see this, uh, the same difference in the presidential with Barack Obama. And you, I would challenge folks to look at those who were registered in that community and if this was their first time voting in a municipal election as well. And in a minute, we're going to see another clip uh, that is about stop and frisk, so kind of continues the conversation that we saw in the last clip. Does anybody else in the audience want to react? Let, let, let me ask you a question. I don't know if we can get a shot of everybody uh, as a group. Ra 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 raise your hands if you have seen that Joe Loda ad before tonight. Any of you guys have a reaction? Anybody want to just step, well, step right up, up to the, the mic? mic and give us your name and your campus, please. Um, hey guys, uh, my name is Joseph, and I go to Queens College. Um, uh, while I agree that the Loda ad is, uh, you know, the purpose is fear mongering, and while that be, while that may be like very lowbrow politics, um, but attaching the race card to it, um, uh, associating crime with race isn't that just a racist sentiment in and of itself? If there's no uh, minorities. Um, on depicted. the television, right? So um, uh, I, I would agree with you, but. Also in the ad, there were people of color in the ad, and it's sort of the imagery specifically used at certain times is what sort of elicited the connection between crime and people of color. So it, it, it's that particular, and I agree with him that particularly saying if you say crime in New York City, it automatically means people of color was not the issue. The issue was that at particular times in the ad, people of color were depicted, and the faces and um, imagery used is what connected it um, in, in that that racial light. Um, but I will say, you know, what's interesting, even, you know, for a, a Republican running in a six to one city, you know, if he wants to talk about crime, you know, I would have advised him to talk about it in Brownsville and East New York where there's guns and, you know, and, and drugs there, but they didn't pivot that way. Did you want to come back with anything? No, it's, it's all right. No, it's also, who, and if you want it, who else? Yeah, why don't you go up to the mic, but Bob, while he's getting You know, there. it's um, also the case that, you know, again, I keep using the word signifiers. There are certain kind of 
it's coded. You know, I, you know, I, you know I, I covered Joe Lodo. Joe Lodo, if you'll pardon my saying so, was kind of the rational wing of the Giuliani administration. He's a <laughs> highly competent administrator, understands financing. I mean, one of the things that struck me, there was no discussion of the fact we have an $8 billion hole in terms of back union contracts, which is going to restrict anything de Blasio or any, any other mayor is going to want to do in terms of carrying out his, um, you know, carrying out his program. But, you know, it worked for Rudy Giuliani to a degree. And, you know, and I think the, I think the questioner is right. You know, you know, one of the arguments in favor of the stop and frisk program is that, you know, people of color are overwhelmingly the majority of victims of crime. Um, I think that you also have the case that uh, that crime has gone down, murders have gone down, as the number of stop and frisk cases have gone down. So, I mean, the, uh, the suggestion that that you know that Police Commissioner Kelly has made and that Mayor and that Mayor Bloomberg has made is that there's some correlation. Even their own statistics don't show it. Right. But you also have the case where Bloomberg. One of his really abiding accomplishments was to lower the racial temperature in this city. Up until the last year, when the issue of stop and frisk became so such a pronounced offense, if you will, in, in communities of color, and, uh, and, and his refusal or inability to understand the, you know, the degree to which you know, kids are being stopped without any probable cause or reasonable suspicion, whatever standard they want. Right. And de Blasio made a very interesting point, because I know this, because I've experienced this as well, is that beat cops are very unhappy with this, because they're the ones who have to bear the, who have to be on the front line of a deteriorating and, and in relationship. That, in that next clip, he's going to bring that up, but Joy? Yeah, but I mean, I would agree with you that racial tension certainly wasn't at the same level as Rudy Giuliani with Mayor Bloomberg, but I think you're missing that there still was sort of a racial, comp a racial component of people of color not being happy yes. with the Bloomberg administration. But, but do you agree run. mostly in the last few years a stop and frisk really ramped up? You remember that one of the very first things that Bloomberg did after being elected was to have a meeting with Al yeah. Sharpton, which Giuliani had always refused to do. All right. he ever wanted to do was demonize Al Sharpton. Right. And a lot of people uh, in the black community took that as you know, a slap in their face, a poke in their right. eye, and it, wasn't, and, it, and it wasn't only that. It was sort of the, uh, uh, the race, you know, sort of other racial issues of sort of not just meeting with, Rever you know, with yes. Reverend Sharpton. And Michael Bloomberg didn't just meet with Al Sharpton, right. you know, he did Reached other out. things that um, made him approachable and sort of made him, and you could see a stark difference between him and Giuliani, and that sort of calm. But That's that right. doesn't mean that there wasn't sort of this um, other relationship that people of color had with Bloomberg. And, and he tried, emphasis tried, to speak Spanish. Uh, <laughs> let's go to our next questioner. Hi. Hi. We've sort of gone a little bit far, a little bit off uh, this topic, but I, just to sort of go back to that, um, something that you had mentioned with respect to lowering the racial temperature. And, and then your, um, your response to Joseph, was it? Um, was and tell me your name and sorry, what school yes. you're I'm, from, sorry. Hi, I'm Azari Hakoin. I'm from Queens College. Um, and I guess, I guess the question is, sort of the response was that they did include people of color. And I guess the question is that, isn't that in and of itself, I mean, by the fact that they included, had they not have included, wouldn't that have been reverse racism? Or I mean, couldn't that have gone the other way? I mean, the second we politicize the races of people in Well, everything is going to be politicized in a political yeah. season. So. <laughs> well, and next time we'll have to get you a higher microphone. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I, I guess the issue there is whether they included people of color as the innocent right. people who were in fear of crime or only as the sort of swarthy looking ones who were making, you know. And there's also the issue of historical movements. context, right? There's historical context in that for people of color, particularly black and Latino men, they have been demonized and viewed as criminal and um, scary and dark. And so no, uh, there are not many other races, there are not white men that have that same historical context as looking at them is dark over centuries. But at, the, but at the same time, I want to come back to the point that, you know, I want to come back to Enquist's point, which is that that's not this city. Right. I mean, that ad was so discordant. But that's so why it discordant. doesn't work. It, was so, it, was, it struck such a discordant... What, what do you mean, but not that's why, I mean, But I mean, that's why it won't work. There were old clips in there, like mm -hmm. I think Crown Heights Riot was one of those clips, but uh, that motorcycle incident just happened. Yes, well, the mo but, I mean, you're always going to have 
horrendous incidents any place, and especially in a city of this size. Of, of this size. But for those of us of a certain age who understand what the tenor of this city was in 1988, at the height of the crack epidemic, at, at you know when you did have you know 2,000 murders in 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 one year. It's a very, I mean, you have all this crime that's been driven down so, so successfully in large part by scientific approaches to police tactics well, and, and that's stuff. Because and that's, that's why, to me, it struck such a discordant note because right. people, I don't, I don't know anybody who thinks we're going to go back to yes. that. And it's because you have the, you know, the administration talking about the, you know, all the murders are down and so people see the numbers. You have people that can walk 42nd Street, that can walk throughout the city and walk throughout the outer boroughs and sort of, and in, in most places, sort of not be hit over the head and robbed as if we were in 1980, you know, 88 or in the 90s. And so that's the difference. People don't feel, they may feel that their paycheck doesn't go along way, but they don't feel that if I go outside, someone is going to harm me. But that low to ed speaks to a fear of crime. And it could be that we in the media are more focused than the population is on stop and frisk as an issue, as opposed to crime itself as an issue. Listen to this question that the moderator on Channel 2 last night, Maurice Dubois, puts to the candidates on stop and frisk. New polling is showing that voters are much more concerned, Mr. de Blasio, with keeping the crime rate down than reforming stop and frisk. 62 to 30 percent. What do you say to that? New polling showed a couple of things. It showed that voters are very concerned about keeping our city safe. Uh, obviously, they understand the incredible strides we've made and the great work done by the NYPD, and we want to keep that going, keep that going strong. I believe we can do it even better. We bring police and community back together by ending the overuse of stop and frisk and the division it's caused. But the other thing you saw in this recent poll is people believe, by a clear, wide margin, they believe that we can make the city safer and end the overuse of stop and frisk and the abuses of stop and frisk that have unfortunately caused a rift between police and community in many neighbors of the city. You know what? Talk to beat cops and they'll tell you. They don't want a stop and frisk quota. So what do you think? I mean, I, I, you know, I spoke to um, the folks from the Community so Service Society, the advocacy group for poor people in New York, and they do a, a scientific poll every year that they call the lower third, the unheard mm -hmm. third survey of people who make the lower third of incomes, mm -hmm. lowest third of incomes in the city. And that also, when, a when asking people to identify issues, came up with crime as number two, right behind jobs with upward mm -hmm. mobility. It was crime and stop and frisk was way down the list. So there is an appeal to be made there on fear of crime, isn't there? If they do it in the right way. There is, a, um, but it's doing it in the right way, just like you said, right? So if Joe Loda's ad had been particularly featuring people of color from Brownsville and East New York, Bedford Stuyvesant, and them talking about gun violence in their neighborhoods and the rise of, you know, sort of iPhone, you know, uh, thefts and things like that, that would be different yeah. because that would be talking to a community who is a victim of crime, but more, uh, but in those sort of areas in those neighborhoods. The difference is, is that most people think of crime and they're thinking about Madison Avenue and 42nd Street and sort of not looking at the outer boroughs where the sort of gun trafficking and gun violence is going on. So, and so that's the difference. Because of the stop and frisk controversy, Bill de Blasio supported a bill that passed city council recently to impose an inspector general on the NYPD to oversee some of what they do. And Joe Loda went after de Blasio on that in the debate last night. Let's watch. Here's what's wrong with the inspector general legislation that went past and uh, was passed by the uh, city council. It, all of the agencies that you talked about, the FBI, the CIA, the MTA had an inspector general. The MTA's inspector general, as with all the others, did not have the right to question the boss's strategy and decisions. But this inspector general at city council can in fact question the strategies and the approach and the tactics of the police commissioner and his entire command. That is wrong. An inspector general, you want him to audit? Great. You want him to inspect? Great. You want him to question the strategy? That's wrong. That's the job of the mayor. And you, as a candidate for mayor, should allow that responsibility to stay let, with let the mayor. Let me be clear on okay. this, Maurice. F 15 of seconds, course, please. Of course, it is the mayor's job to choose the right police commissioner and then to lead and manage that police commissioner. But 
An independent inspector general has been proven to work at the CIA, FBI, and every major police department in the country because they question policies that may not be working. There's nothing wrong with checks and balances. It's the American way. Okay, and independent oversight is healthy for the NYPD. Gentlemen, thank you. All right. So, Bob, I thought that that clip was really about two things. It was about fear and not weakening the NYPD, but it was also about leadership. It was also Loda saying, Bill de Blasio, you're not even going to be in charge of your own administration. It's like saying the U.N. is going to be in charge of the United States, but at city level. Right, but I think that's... Um yeah, but I think that's an if if that's his claim, then that's an overstatement. I mean, you know, that would be like arguing that the uh, New York City Inspector General uh, Rose Rose Gill Hearn somehow her ability to independently investigate what goes on in the some city somehow takes away from the independence of the mayor. It's not the case. Um, and the Inspector I, General is only advisory, is my understanding. The Inspector General may raise constitutional issues about stop and frisk, or who knows the what the Inspector Department. General is going to raise. But it's advisory, it's not binding, right? But the police department is quite overregulated from the outside. I mean, you have the civilian complaint board, it's overseen by a whole range by a by a whole range of outside authorities. Now, arguably, if you have uh, in essence our military force, and you, there is the question of civilian control of the military to the degree that the police department is yeah. our military, and it's appropriate. So I think there's a legitimate debate here. I think that the fear of the inspector general, personally, I think is overstated. And I think de Blasio is making a point is that, you know, constitutional protections and outside oversight of police decisions are not inconsistent with effective policing. I mean, he's right. spoken very strongly about wanting to crack down on crime. In the motorcycle incident, he wanted to crack down on, you know, use the cops to arrest people who were doing this kind of a thing. Right. But so the this, I, so I mean, but again, with the question of signifiers, that he's, you know, Loder's trying to paint a picture of, uh, going back to the Sandinista, this rather strange uh, Marxist attack that happened early on in the campaign. He's, all, you know, he's trying to paint de Blasio as some kind of an unreformed yeah. child of the 1960s. Right. But uh, the Inspector General does have subpoena power under this law, mm -hmm. right? So who knows if we don't get into a situation somewhere doesn't down every the road... IG, doesn't every department's IG have subpoena power? Where de Blasio and the Inspector General, any mayor and the Inspector General, could wind up at loggerheads and a mayoral candidate who supported this may come to regret it because he'll be doing what he feels needs to be done with the NYPD and the inspector general may be tugging at him and trying to fight that policy by subpoenaing people and calling hearings. Yeah. Well, we'll see how the, you know, the policy plays out. But I, I think to um, Bob's um, uh, comment, you know, you have to balance people's civil liberties and public safety. And it can be done. You know, and I think that, you know, it's a natural reaction for any department, any agency, any person to feel some kind of offense um, of someone coming in and sort of having subpoena power, someone coming in and sort of questioning your policies and your programs. But at this point, it needs to be done. And they're not the only one that this has happened to. The LAPD has had an inspector general at some time. Other um, municipal uh, police departments have had it at this time. So wouldn't the NYPD want to not only continue to bring crime down and be and, and uh keep the city safe, but then also make sure that the citizens that they have volunteered to serve feel safe and protected from them. Let's move on to some other areas of policy. I also want to invite any student in our audience now who wants to line up behind the mic and ask a question or say something in reaction to these debate clips to do so, and we'll get to you in just a minute. So why don't you line up behind the mic and uh, we'll get right to you. We're going to move on to what is one of the central proposals of the de Blasio campaign, raising the city income tax slightly less than a percentage point on people who make $500,000 or more. That is basically the 1%, uh, to use an Occupy phrase. The top 1% of people in New York City make about $500,000 and more. And he would dedicate that tax increase, the revenue from it, to uh, establishing universal pre-K, enough pre-K seats for all the four-year-olds in the city to go for the full school day. So that came under attack last night from Joe Loda, who said, you'll never get that tax through the state legislature. Watch.
Look, on the, on the pre-K issue, you can pay for it. Right now, Bill wants to raise by charging taxes on the rich. And by the way, if you're in the middle class, hold on to your wallet because no one has ever been able to just tax the rich. The reality is uh, we need universal pre-K. The amount of money that Bill wants to raise is somewhere between 500 and $550 million. That's less than 1% of the entire budget. When I was the budget director, I used to get 3 and 4% savings every year to allow Mayor Giuliani and Speaker Peter Vallone the opportunity to expand programs just like this. It's an eternal claim. You can pay for things by rooting out waste and fraud. Democrats make that case when it's in their interest. Republicans make that case when it's in their interest, when they don't want to talk about raiding the budget or raising I, taxes to pay for things. No? I, well, yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, of course you can say that, but I think this was one of Loda's strongest points. Um, he knows that the governor is in an election that, that you can't have this tax surcharge unless it's approved by the state legislature and the governor, and they're facing an election year next year in which the, in which the governor is talking about lowering taxes. So even though the governor today said, well, I didn't really say that it's dead on arrival, <laughs> but that, you know, I'll talk to him and stuff, but he's being basically supportive of the candidate's books. But what... But what Loda was able to do was for, for one of the few times in the debate last night is talk about his strength as a, as a manager. You know, the man has managed, you know, not only has been the city budget director and the deputy mayor of operations, has been in municipal finance, has been a major figure in Cablevision, which I think is one of the evil companies of the city, but that's a separate <laughs> point. I mean, the man is a master manager and he was able to go to his strengths on that question. Whatever the substance of the debate over the tax itself. Right. It showed Joe Loda as jo with Joe Loda. If his numbers are accurate, then it certainly is a strength that he can draw on from his actual experience. And interesting to me, Joy, was that they didn't disagree right. on the goal. Yes. This was what Maurice uh, Dubois, the moderator, called one of the kumbaya moments <laughs> of the debate. Yeah. Joe Loda, too. The Republican mm -hmm. thinks it's important to spend public dollars to have universal full-day pre-K in New York City. I think that well, should not get lost. Right, and, and that's because, and I agree with Bob, you know, I, I think also, you know, he's a, you know, the New York breed of Republicans. That's right. right? You know, right? And Rockefeller so they're, Republican. Right, they're right. not that, you know, they're not trying to restrict everyone's rights, <laughs> you know, sort of restrict the budget and everything. And I think he has had too few opportunities to be able to display his strengths as being a manager and, and being able to display that he can run the city. You know, one of the things I argue is I think they waited too late during the prime you know, sort of during the primary and right after the primary, um, to be able to get ahead and talk about his strengths as a manager, how he can run the city, and his specific policies. And unfortunately, he hasn't had enough opportunity to talk about that. And him supporting, you know, universal pre-K, I mean, it's the numbers. We know that it helps children, you know, down the road. It helps parents to not have a half day. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why a number of kids are not in that. But also, politically, it, history it, suggests that nobody cares about <laughs> management experience. When Barack Obama was running against Hillary Clinton in the primary, and she had all this experience, and he had a speech, as she said, to attack him. People who were inspired by him did not care. I think we saw the same thing in the Democratic primary in the mayoral campaign. Christine Quinn had all this managerial experience and experience pulling together people as, you know, city council speaker, but people were inspired by de Blasio. They did not care. Well, let's understand how de Blasio, in, in my assessment, this, for, much of this, from, for much of this year, Christine Quinn was the mayor apparent. Anthony Weiner jumps into the race, and all of a sudden he winds up as the front runner, which showed, which tells me that the support for Christine Quinn was a mile and a half wide and an inch and a half deep. When Anthony Weiner implodes the second time, when the, when the second sexting comes out, he was still doing it in, uh, you know, a year after he had resigned from Congress, around the same time, what happened? The Dante de Blasio ad with the Afro goes on the air. I want to be Dante's agent. That's the one, <laughs> the one job I want in the new administration. Um, and, captured, and captured the attention. And de Blasio, all of a sudden, people started paying attention to de Blasio, who nobody was paying attention to most of the year. So, but with this debate over, in, in, in which Lode is allowed to present himself as a reasonable Rockefeller Republican, you have, you had a very serious debate and a good Republican Democratic mm -hmm. debate. Right. De Blasio says, I think we should tax the wealthiest people among us. Lode says, 
And then he says, and, and Lodo, you want to lower corporate taxes and you want to give all kinds of tax breaks as incentives, et cetera. That's a real debate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, I happen to think that these were, that both debates were pretty good. Yeah. If you get away from some of the theatrics and you listen to them, you actually learn something about it. I think that the so racial, that the racial aspect, candidate. That, that the racial aspect was really destructive to what Loda wants to do. And you can be Dante's agent. Don't underestimate Kiara. <laughs> I'm a big Kiara fan. <laughs> too. Ten percent. <laughs> Let's go to another question uh, from the audience. Somebody was about to to get up there. Hi. Yes. Good evening. How T are you? Tell us your name and school. My name is Jairo Guerra, and I attend Lehman College. And watching all this analysis uh, from you guys, the question that I have is the following: Why isn't Joe Loda focusing on the issue of cities management? Isn't this you seen that his best chance in this contest? Mm -hmm. uh, as we yeah. were just discussing. We were just discussing that. And like I said, I think they missed a moment during the um, primaries. I know he was up against Casamitidis and had a very large war chest. Um, but even immediately, you know, sort of after the primary, I don't think they really capitalized to be able to tell his story and for him to jump on, um, you know, jump on that and sort of get in the hearts and minds of voters. And I think they just waited a little too long. And like you mentioned, sort of in a year, he would be better. I don't yes. think he was sort of up for it yet. No, well, yes, I was saying, in an, I don't mean in another year, uh, if he had an extra year. I mean, I at another time, in another <laughs> election year, Loda would be a very Except that, candidate. You know, and I think to your point that he has, and, and Bob, I want to know what you think, in another, uh, it, another opportunity that is missed is really to capitalize on the reason that he's a candidate in the first place, which is he was one of the heroes of Sandy for his getting the trains back running so quickly as MTA chairman after the storm. And we are not Despite about raising that. the fare right. and, and raising I think the tolls, despite raising the fares, it, it, right. it remains a strength for him. That's right. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's no ad on that, right? And, and that's a, a, a huge strength. You know that people are still experiencing the effects of Sandy, and there's no ad. Maybe in the last three days, I don't know, but there's no ad talking about that strength and sort of talking about what he's done. The, I think maybe what they're thinking uh, possibly is if you open that door, even though De Blasio already opened that during the debate um, last night and has many times, has talked about the dysfunction uh, or what people view as the dysfunction of the MTA and sort of raising rates and sort of you open the door but for that conversation. You're, but you're opening another door. You're opening the Rudy. <laughs> Giuliani door and because his you know besides the MTA he's saying I ran the city budget I was even there on 9-11 I you know I ran I was the deputy mayor and for up until really virtually last night he avoided Rudy Giuliani mm. because you know he was he had to hold on to Rudy Giuliani to win the Republican primary and then he had to run away from Rudy Giuliani in the general election well that wasn't working and, you know, he not only, you know, de Blasio tried to, has tried to pin Giuliani's lack of popularity. I must say I haven't heard a lot of people pine for the days of Rudy Giuliani. Mm -hmm. And what Loda did is he turned around and tried to pin whatever the failings are of David Dinkins on, on, Bill, on Bill de Blasio. But the difference in, in, in that, just in, in a number of people can see through, is that, you know, look at the position in terms of Loda being in the Giuliani administration and sort of what he was responsible for versus Bill de Blasio being a special assistant or, be, you know, being an aide to someone else. Let's hear from another student. Hi there. Hi, my name is Jane. I'm from Queens College. What does the, the debate say about Joe Loda's real temperament? He seems to get unnerved very easily. <laughs> By the way, Queens College representing. <laughs> I don't know. You know, that you get to I, don't know. I don't think so. No, I. I mean, you know, and this becomes fodder. You know, even in the debates, you know, they asked about him calling Bloomberg a pin. What was it? A pinhead an or idiot. something like he that? Called an, him idiot. an idiot. Then he called. Um, and he called Port Authority cops mall cops. Yeah, I mean, we're New Yorkers. <laughs> no, but I know. But I got to tell you, I covered. I covered Loda. I covered the Giuliani administration as a reporter. And Loda was a breath of fresh air because Loda went off the reservation. That was a very controlled, the message was very controlled in that administration. We would have to put Joe off the record to protect himself against <laughs> himself. Because, so Joe is, uh, but Joe is not used to the, until this year, he's never had to be the front man. Right. And that's a very different, when people are actually paying attention to right. what you say. I don't, I don't, this I don't think is a fair ground of criticizing yeah. Loda because it's tough. You know, yeah. I would never want to put up with the questions that I would ask. Yeah, so. <laughs> and I, and I th and I think you know just to you know uh, further expand on them. I mean, the things that he was calling it, I don't think 
you know, the mayor might have been offended, you know, or, or, or things like that. But I don't think other voters are sort of making their decision on his, te you know, on his temperament. I think it will end up being uh, he's a New Yorker and he's passionate and he's in a, you know, and he's in a debate. I don't think it will cost him anything. But also, let me just make one small point on this management question, which is one of the ways you judge a first time elected official is how you run your campaign. Mm -hmm. And Loda, who is a master manager, in my opinion, has run a very poor campaign. But do you de think Blasio, that's because... De Blasio, who has had no, you know, virtually no management experience, has run, a, has managed a masterful campaign. But I think and there's I think a difference that speaks, there. And I think people react to the fact if he's run a good campaign, Maybe he can run a good. De Blasio story. was Hillary Clinton's. Uh, yeah, he he's a, yeah. a, a long but time very, operative. But it's a but it's versus very Loda, different, who has yes. been sort of you know a, a lead sta you know staffer. Joe Loda hasn't sort of been a politician. You know, he has been a city worker. That's right. You know, an administration worker. He has not been a politician, and I don't get the sense that I think he is trusting you know his campaign team. Um, to to uh, do what they know best. I, I don't think he, he knows that. He's got to take warm and fuzzy lessons. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Oh, What's hey. up? Hi, uh, my name is Jose Waman. I go to Brooklyn College. I got a question for you guys. Uh, how do you think Mayor Bloomberg feels when he watches these debates and the two candidates are ta talking past him and focusing on Rudy Giuliani versus David Dinkins? Troy. I think maybe he may be relieved that they're not talking about his um, policies, but I genuinely think he may not care, you know, in terms of them, talk, you know, sort of talking over his administration. You know, they're in the last couple of days of his administration. The, he's, you know, sort of talking about his legacy as mayor. I don't think he really feels slighted that there aren't debating his policies or his administration. Well, unless he wants to go for a fourth term. And he shouldn't, <laughs> we don't shouldn't. have time for that, Isn't thank God. Late? It's not <laughs> it's too late. late. <laughs> no, I think it's, but I, I do think it's interesting is that there's a, you know, I mean, when you look at polling data, people think Bloomberg's done a good job and they're tired of him and it's time for him to go. But people do think that he's done a good job. And I think that de Blasio has been much more explicit in criticizing Bloomberg and I and, think, uh, Loda has. And I think the mayor must be very frustrated right now watching what appears to be the inevitability of one of his biggest critics uh, about to succeed him. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Paulina Leva, and I am here from the City College of New York. So my question for you is, when all is said and done, which issue um, will the election be decided on? Education, housing, crime, class and race, referendum on Bloomberg's uh, 12 years in office? I think what we're missing is sort of the, you know, sort of jobs and sort of the... And the, housing. And, and housing, you know, and, that, and that's because... And there was a very good discussion of affordable housing. Right. And that's because, you know, besides sort of stopping for it sort of rising to the level that it did as an issue, I think one of the reasons that a number of people voted for de Blasio and sort of um, carried him over the top is sort of this uh, uh, narrative of two cities. Right. And so people feel that in their pocket, you know, and they feel it in their homes, and their apartments. And so they, that's something that they can identify with. And I think and when, I think that's going to be the major issue. And I think when de Blasio runs on inequality and that's the overarching theme, because obviously that was successful for him mm -hmm. and that resonates with so many people who are struggling in the city. Housing is at the heart of that. And that here is that exchange um, that really was a good substantive two minute or so exchange on affordable housing from last night's debate. Affordable housing. This is for both of you. We'll start with Mr. de Blasio. You've both made it clear that you would aggressively build affordable housing in our city. I'm curious, so in a city where the average income is around $50,000 a year, what should the rent be for a two-bedroom apartment? Look, I think what's happening in this city, 46% of people in this city at or near the poverty level, uh, for a lot of folks, uh, annual income, 30, 40, 50,000, so they need a rent that they can afford. Might be uh, in the 1000 to $1,500 a, rent a month range, for example. So given that, would you but force... But that's one example. We're obviously talking about a sliding scale depending on income. would you force developers to build it? How can they make that work financially? Because what we would offer to developers is opportunities that they can't have right now. Look, this is the key part. The public sector controls the spigot of development. Uh, we would give opportunities to developers to develop areas they're not developing yet and uh, to have the heightened density to truly uh, make it profitable but we'd say the only way you get to develop is if you give us enough affordable housing and with enough mix of income levels covered 
to actually represent what's going on in the city today. We have the power of New York, in New York City to do that, to require that. Mayor Bloomberg wouldn't do it. He was lenient towards the real estate industry. He had many situations where they promised to create affordable housing and then didn't follow through on the promise. Thank you, sir. I would make it a requirement. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lotus, same question. Somewhere between $750 and $1,250 for someone who's making $50,000 a year, and I'm presuming it's a family. That's what the number needs to be. We need to subsidize these uh, homes by giving them tax breaks on the real property tax. What I've talked about, and by the way, Mr. de Blasio said I've done nothing in affordable housing. Well, let me tell you, for five years of my life, I did nothing but finance lower and moderate income housing here in New York, in the state of Connecticut, and in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. My experience is vast and broad on the financing side. But here's what we also need to do. We need to find out where we can build it. I want every piece of surplus property that's owned by a state agency. As mayor, I want to use it to build affordable housing. Joy, you think anybody landed anything there? Well, I think for Loda, he identified a number um, in, in terms of a, a, a range. That was lower than de Blasio's number. That was lower. I don't know um, in terms of a, a achievability, and that's the problem when talking about affordable housing, right, is the achievability so in dealing hard. with the various, um, you know, developers and landlords and, you know, sort of a, a tax break. It, it's so much. And not to mention that our area median income is high because of the city that we live in, that we have so many um, diversifying incomes. The AMI or the area median income for the city they talked about 50,000 but it's $63,000 and that's for four a family of four right so if you have that high AMI which we you know are one of the you know metropolitan areas in the country that has that it's very difficult um, in a, a difficult mixture to make sure that you build affordability because the question that voters in the community always has is affordable for who and I don't know if they got to this I didn't actually see the entire housing exchange last night but Joe Lota says that de Blasio's idea for mandatory inclusionary zoning, what he was discussing, requiring mm -hmm. landlords uh, to include developers, some affordable, developers. Uh, mm -hmm. developers to include some affordable with their market rate housing, is unconstitutional. Well, what, uh, what the, the difference is, is that Lota is saying only if somebody comes for some kind of a variance, only, by, only if a developer comes for some kind of city action, then you can mandate an affordability component. De Blasio is saying no, that we have a broader power in allowing that that because you because the city still as he says controls the spigot of development, that the city has a broader power to require developers of market rate housing to build right. some affordability. It's not a huge it's it's a it's a difference. I don't think it's a game changing difference. Mm -hmm. I think you you again saw Loda talking about his experience in municipal finance and in the financing of housing. You saw him going and trying to focus on his management experience, yeah. which is his strong point. And, you know, there's a difference, you know, uh, basically you have de Blasio. I don't think people question de Blasio's commitment. Loda is saying, you, you know, I share that commitment and I've done it. So that's the kind of, that's the dichotomy. And, that and they're basically Loda arguing over the policy in terms of how do you get it done. The same thing with pre-K, right? They're not arguing that it doesn't uh, have to wait, be done. It's Loda, how do you pay for Loda it? Loda even told me in an interview last week that he would declare a housing emergency day yes. on day one mm -hmm. of his administration. Let's turn to education. Hi, you have a question about education, don't you? Um, yes, hi, my name is Doria. Um, I attend John Jay College. Um, the question that I have for you guys um, is about school safety. Um, mm -hmm. um, as you guys may have heard, um, an autistic teenager um, escaped his school um, due to the side doors um, being unlocked. And um, I would like to know um, what kind of measures or um, steps can be taken to um, assure that our students can be more safe and secure in their schools and to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again? If only we knew. Um, it's, there are a lot of complex questions in the Avante Akendo case. Yeah. Um, One of them is co-location of mm -hmm. a school that's for special ed kids that include kids who are so uh, autistic as he is with regular ed kids and the fact that maybe, we don't know, but maybe whoever was in charge there couldn't tell the difference that he was one of the kids who wasn't allowed to leave the school? Hmm. 
Well, I, I think um, in, in particular, I mean, this is a case that has um, captivated sort of the city so far. I know for me, you know, just seeing the signs up and sort of um, hearing from the family on um, the missing. And, you know, the school safety extends from not only protecting the students while they're in school, but also people have questions and parents have questions about how school safety is operating within the school. And particularly, not only are they keeping them safe, but then uh, is there excess force used? Is there excess um, suspension and police activity? use with children in, in schools. And so I, I don't think that that's sort of risen to a level overall that it'll be an issue, a major issue in the campaign. Um, and certainly with this case, it hasn't, you know, risen to that level. Um, but I do think that's some, some of what uh, parents are concerned about um, with their kids. It's always a delicate balance. Mm -hmm. How do you make feel, how kids feel safe? in tough schools without making it seem like a jail. Right. Uh, the same argument on stop and frisk. You know, how do right. you protect people's civil liberties by keeping them safe? They also talked about charter schools last night. Um, in this clip, we're going to see um, Loda's um, charge against de Blasio when it comes to charter schools. The reason why parents marched on the Brooklyn Bridge a few weeks ago is because Mr. de Blasio was threatening to annihilate our charter schools. And they believe it. You start charging them rent, they're gone. And during the Bloomberg years, charter schools did have more power and influence. So I've simply said, they're not going to be favored anymore. I'll work with them, but they're not going to be favored anymore. 95% of our kids go to traditional public schools, as my kids did. Thank you, sir. 95%. And that's where we have to focus our attention. Bob Liff, uh, Joe Lota is trying to make charter schools the other central issue in the campaign. He's right. And uh, the because focus he says they're popular. The focus has been on the focus has been on co-location. I have two kids in, in traditional public schools, and uh, De Blasio makes the point that 95 percent of kids are in traditional public schools. The issue of co-location has is a very complicated issue. He says that some of the new schools that can afford it should be required to pay rent if they get if they get into public schools. Loda says you that you're trying to annihilate by uh, doing them. Um, Loda wants to expand them, and, and de Blasio, in what's basically kind of trying to do away with this, I'm just a union hack, saying, I'm not going to do away with them. I'm going to accept the status right. quo. I just don't want to increase the number. Well, and, and here's the other thing, and the reason why this becomes an issue is because the voters and, um, and parents have, for the last couple of years, sort of education has been the central issue and something that Mayor Bloomberg himself said he wanted to hang his hat on in terms of his legacy on transforming education in the city. And charter schools and co-location is one of those hot button issues that parents and voters really care about particularly if their kids are in those facilities particularly minority that have, parents particularly, particularly people minority yes parents, particularly right. people of color yes who don't want to wait for every right. bad school to be fixed because how right. long is that going to take rather than trying some new ones however we are not going to resolve this tonight <laughs> because we are out of time we thought we could settle all the world's problems <laughs> in an hour but not quite we needed another 20 minutes. Thank you all, <laughs> students who came down tonight for participating in our pre-election special. And thank you to L. Joy Williams and, of course, my co-host, Bob Liff. Thanks, L. Thanks, Joy. Thanks to my co-host, Brian. And um, we'll see you again on CUNY Forum. And don't forget, Election Day is less than two weeks off, Tuesday, November 5th. Thanks for watching. And tune in to my radio program weekdays at 10 a.m. on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM 820. On tomorrow's show, I will interview Bill de Blasio. Good night.